Today we're in 2 Kings chapter 18, and we're going to look at verses 17 to 25. But I wanted, the title of this is called Sennacherib Smack Talk. Now Sennacherib is the king of Assyria, and he has been wreaking havoc in Samaria. He's taken it over, him and the Assyrians. And now he's on his way to Jerusalem, and Hezekiah is a little nervous. Now, uh, I don't know, have any of you guys ever talked smack? <laughs> right? I mean, this is Calvary Chapel, Chino Valley. Nobody here has ever talked smack, right? I see Sugar Bear shaking his head, yes. <laughs> At one point in our lives, if you guys have ever played sports, you've talked smack. Have you, have you ever been the one that has given the smack talking? Yes. And have you ever received smack talking? Yes, right? We've been the ones that have been dishing out or been on the ones on the receiving end of it. But when we think about it, what is smack talking or what is talking smack? Well, I looked it up in the almighty Google and, uh, and it's a boastful, insulting speech. And what it does, it's intended to demoralize or humiliate an opponent in a very disrespectful way. I'm going to stop right there and we're going to start reading our passage for today. And we're going to see that the king of Assyria begins to talk smack to King Hezekiah, the king of Judah. And I want to point out some things here, guys, how the enemy uses this type of language to bring fear and discourage us. Let's start with verse 17, 2 Kings 18, starting with verse 17. Marco, we prayed for you. We're surprised we're back. We thought maybe you took off to TJ. You got your wedding coming up. So, 2 Kings chapter seven, uh, 18, beginning with verse 17. Then the king of Assyria set out the Tartan, the Rapsaris, and the Rebshakeh from Lachish with a great army against Jerusalem to King Hezekiah. And they went up and, and came to Jerusalem. When they had come up, they, they went and stood by the aqueduct from the upper pool, which was the, on the highway to Fuller's Field. And when they had called it to, they had called to the king, Ilakim, the son of Hilkiah, who was over the household, Shebna, the scribe, Joash, the son of Asaph, the recorder, came out to them. Then Rabshakeh said to them, Say now to Hezekiah, Thus says the great king, the king of Assyria, What confidence is this in which you trust? You speak of having plans and powerful war, but they are mere words. And in whom do you trust? That you rebel against me? Now look, you are trusting in the staff of this broken reed, Egypt, on which if a man leans, if it will go into his hand and pierce it, so Pharaoh the king of Egypt to all who trust in him. But if you say to me, we trust in the Lord our God, is not he the one whose high places and whose altar Hezekiah has taken away and said to Judah and Jerusalem, you shall worship before this altar in Jerusalem? Now therefore, I urge you, give a pledge to my master, the king of Assyria, and I will give you 2,000 horses if you're able to uh, if you're able on your part to put riders on them, how then will you repel one captain of the least of my master's servants and put your trust in Egypt for chariots and horsemen? For I have come up with, I have come now up without the Lord against this place to destroy it. The Lord said to me, go up to this land and destroy it. So we see that these three people that are high officials of King Sennacherib, king of Assyria, have come and now started sending messages to the king of Judah, Hezekiah. Now what's interesting, as we looked at last week, that Hezekiah became fearful. And remember with me that he was the one that when you look back at chapter 18, verse 7, it says that the Lord was with Hezekiah, he prospered wherever he went, and he rebelled against the king of Assyria. When you look at 2 Chronicles chapter 31, you will see that Hezekiah is telling the people of Jerusalem, be courageous, be strong, for they'll stand in the ways of the Lord and dwell in his commandments. He was encouraging the people that, hey, we're going to stand against this king, and when this king comes against us, we're going to stand fast and hold on to the Lord. 
But we saw last week as when his, uh, King Sennacherib of Syria started coming towards Jerusalem and he overtakes a city called Lachish, which is about 40 miles north of Jerusalem, Hezekiah gets nervous. We see last week that uh, messengers were sent to Hezekiah and Hezekiah said, said I'm going to assess you. You're scared. I'm going to overtake your city. I'm going to take your people. I'm going to become the king here. You're going to be my king, and I'm going to set you up, and you're going to do everything I'm going to give you to do, and I'm going to take over. And Hezekiah's like, what do you want from me? Wait a minute, Hezekiah. Didn't you just say you rebelled against the king? Didn't you just tell the people that you're going to stand fast in the Lord? And that to be strong and do not be dismayed and be encouraged. And now the enemy is just miles away, and now you're caving in. He ended up giving the king 300 talents of silver, 30 talents of gold. We looked at last week that the equivalent to that would, the 37, the 300 talents of silver was about $36 million. And the gold was about $26 million. So he gave this large amount over to the enemy as an act of surrender. Don't attack me. Here, I'll give you what you want. He was so nervous and scared that the gold inlaid in God's temple that he would put around the doors, he began to peel it off to give to the king of Assyria. And we talked about last week, men, that when we begin to compromise with the enemy, when we begin to start thinking that I can play with the enemy this and we start compromising and start giving things over to him, what will he will take from us and what we will give him are all the valuable things of the treasures of our hearts. We will begin handing it over to him, thinking that we can compromise with the enemy, thinking that we can compromise with our flesh, and we can't. Because we know that any compromise to the enemy, he's going to demand more. And here, Hezekiah began to say, look, I'm done wrong. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Sennacherib. I'm sorry, great king of Assyria. Here, I'm going to give this to you. And he gave him all the silver that was found in the house of the Lord in the treasuries of the king's house, everything valuable that Jerusalem had, King Hezekiah gave it over to Sennacherib. How often do we do the same thing, men? When we think we can make a deal here, a compromise there, we begin to give our virtues over, our value, our children, our marriages, our families. And it may be not as threatening as Sennacherib, maybe it's something else. Maybe something else that we've been messing with that we're compromising a little bit here and a little bit there. And eventually, men, it's going to take everything valuable from your hearts. We see this pretty impressive speech by this man called Rebshika. These three men that are King Sennacherib's top advisors are now coming to Jerusalem. And Hezekiah doesn't even go out there. He's met with three leaders of Judah. Now, talking smack, we just seen uh, an account here where this man, this, this leader of Assyria, has now come, and he's going to be the spokesperson for the king. As we know him, we, we were introduced to him as Rabshakeh. Now, Rabshakeh in the, in the original language means chief officer, chief of staff, or even a governor. And he is a well-respected high official representing Sennacherib, king of Assyria. So we know that when there is smack talking, and we see it in here, and we're going to look at it in, in a little bit more details, is that it's intended to cast doubt on our, person, our, on our ability. You know, you see football players, basketball players. Ray would play golf with me and talk smack the entire round. That's why I missed those one-foot birdie putts. <laughs> uh, and uh, and, and it, it's to demoralize you, right? I mean, have you guys ever been the recipients of smack talking? I mean, I get it every day with my wife, right? No, but do you guys ever, are you ever been on that end? It's frustrating, right? And, you know, back in the days, those are words to get beat up by. You want to beat somebody up. But what they're trying to do is get into your head. 
They're trying to cast doubt on you. They're trying to shake you up so it takes you off the focus of what you're called to do. You play sports and somebody talks trash. They're doing it because they want you to take your focus off what's before you. And what happens is they, they get into our head. And then we begin to, we're off our game. And the enemy works the same way. He wants to get into our head. He wants to distract us. He wants to whisper to us all these lies because he knows once we're distracted as men of God, we're no good. And so the enemy is after us and is just talking smack. And we know that smack talk is the quickest way to get beat up if it goes too far. One of the biggest, quickest ways to be discouraged if we allow somebody to get into our heads and King Hezekiah has given over into the fear of the Assyrians and is now going to give in more after this Rabshakeh, this governor, this chief of staff, is now talking smack about God. He even said here that, <laughs> didn't you know that the Lord sent me up here to, 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 for you to, to be delivered in my hands? Doesn't the enemy say that to us? Did God really say to you? that you're more than a conqueror? Look at your marriage. Did God really say to you that you were to walk in victory? Look how you're responding. Did God really say? And we began to focus on that and we're off our game. So we see that Sennacherib has now focused his attention on Jerusalem and Hezekiah is getting a little nervous. Now we see back in verse 14, as we're just, again, this is just um, review, that there's a surrender deal being broken in chapter in verse 14, as, as again, he's, Hezekiah is offering the treasuries of the house of God. In 14 through 16, Hezekiah is assessed by Sennacherib and he pays this absurd amount to the king and the king gives him even gold from the doors of the house of the Lord. But now that we begin in verse 17, we see that three people, as we mentioned, are sent by the king of Assyria. We have the Tartan, which is the commander in chief, Rapsaris, which is a chief officer, and Rapshika, which is the chief of staff or a governor, both very key leaders that have obvious clout and status representing the most powerful king at that time in the ancient world. These would be the three heavy hitters that would always represent the king of Assyria. And these are the key leaders that are carrying status. Notice in verse 17, where they come from. They come from Lachish. It says, it gives their name, it says, the king of Assyria sent the Tartan, the Rapsaurus, and the Rapshika from Lachish. Now remember with me, as we were looking before that, Lachish was a city in the in the province of Judah, as the king of Assyria has now taken over Samaria and has now taken away slavery, they brought him back to Assyria. And now he started, the king of Assyria started putting people in from different nations in Samaria, but they totally besieged it and taken it over. And now his focus, as he is now picking up cities on the way to Jerusalem, he's already conquered Lachish. Now, Lachish is a key city because it's a main trade route between Judah and Jerusalem. And it was a major city in Judah that was a fortified city that would be on the lookout from anybody attacking from the north. And we see that this key city has now been taken by the king of Assyria. And even as the Bible had told us in chapter 17 that this city was a fortified city. And that's kind of what was amazing about this as I was reading this is that this city was fortified. But what happened to it that it was so easily taken over by the king of Assyria? Was it fear? Our hearts are fortified by God's word, men. Our hearts are fortified by prayer, through fellowship, coming to church. or We, we have many ways that we can fortify our hearts. But why does it lay siege to the enemy? Because we stop praying. We stop reading God's word. We start listening to country music. And I mean, country music is pretty bad, you guys. We begin to have the appearance of having a fortified heart. 
But when we're not engaged in God's word or in prayer and fellowship, our fortified cities are easily overtaken. And sometimes, men, we have this false sense of I, this false sense of security that our hearts are fortified when they're really not. This city was a fortified city, and now coming from this city are three main key leaders from the king of Assyria. It was once a city of Judah, and now the enemy inhabits that city. And that is the danger, men, when we don't fortify our hearts. We don't fortify our walks with the Lord. We don't fortify strengthening our souls because our, the enemy is always looking at the city of our heart. Our, our hearts fortified this morning. So now here in verses 17 and 18, we have this confrontation. And it's this is where the talking begins. It says in verse 18, uh, I'm sorry, uh, at the middle of verse uh, 17, it says that they came with a great army. Now you see a great army. The word great army here is not this 15-man regiment. We're talking 1,500 plus men. And the word great here means oppressing, heavy, and weighty. It was a threatening-looking army with all these men that came now and surrounded Jerusalem. Isaiah chapter 20, verse 1 speaks of Tartan. It says, in the year that Tartan came to Ashdod, when Sargon, the king of Assyria, sent him, he fought against Ashdod and took it. So these guys are no joke. Isaiah, who was the prophet at this time, speaks about this here in Isaiah chapter 36, verse 2. Then the king of Assyria sent the Rabshakeh with a great army from Lachish to King Hezekiah at Jerusalem, and he stood by the aqueduct from the upper pool on the highway to Fuller's field. Exactly what it tells us here in verse 18. Isaiah is also reporting this, the prophet of God. But imagine the sight of this. Imagine that we have these three high officials representing the king. If the king had three right-hand men, these would be them. Chief of staff, commander-in-chief, one was over, overseeing the military, one was overseeing foreign affairs, and the other one was acting as governor. And now they're approaching the city of Jerusalem, surrounded it with a great army. Imagine the sight of this. The king's top men with this great army getting ready to attack. Does it sound familiar? Because doesn't the enemy use the same tactics on us to strike fear in our hearts by the appearance of things? Somebody had told me the word fear, that it's not biblical. False expectations appearing real. Fear. And a lot of times it's the appearance of things that could shake us up, what it looks like. But 1 Peter 5, 8 tells us to be sober, to be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And what's interesting here in verse uh, 17, that it, it gives us a location. Now, it's interesting that the writer points out this location because it has a significant piece to this, what we're going to be looking at. It says, and they went up in verse 17, middle of verse 17. It says, they went up and came to Jerusalem. Now, notice that anytime they're speaking of Jerusalem, you're going up. Even though they're coming from the north, they're going up. Usually when we're going up, we're going up north. We're going to go up to see so-and-so. We're going to go up north. We're going to go up to Canada. We're going up to Sacramento. They're coming from the south, I mean from the north. But they always reference Judah, I mean, excuse me, Jerusalem as going up. Because Jerusalem is elevated what is it, Bobby, 4,000 feet? About 4,000 feet uh, in elevation. So you're always going up to Jerusalem. And it's interesting, the language here, even though they're coming north, they're coming from the north, they're going up. And it points out here that they came to a place which is called Fuller's Field. Now, Fuller's in those days were laundrymen. Notice that they were by an aqueduct, by a pool, because this was the area of the city that the people would go 
and they would do these, um, uh, uh, it's overlooked, overlooking uh, Northwest where laundry men, fullers, found sufficient water for their trade that Isaiah had challenged Ahaz 33 years ago. When you look at Isaiah chapter seven, verses three through 17, you will see this account on Fuller's Field where Isaiah says either trust Jehovah or trust the face of the Assyrians. So we see here that this is a significant place because it was also a lookout. And this is where they're at. There's an aqueduct nearby, and this is where the fullers or the laundrymen would go, and they would clean, and they would do their business there. And it was overlooking the city, and it was overlooking uh, uh, enough, overlooking the northwest, and it was a, a place where there was enough water. So it was a source of water there. And these three king's officials come, and they begin to call out King Hezekiah. It's that we see here that it's Rabshakeh who does all the talking, but he, but he, here he's the message that he wanted Hezekiah's officials to talk to are here. Now, something to point out here. Look who it says it talks to in verse 18, who these Rabshakeh speaks to. He says that when they called to ki the king Hezekiah, Eli Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, who was over the household, the household of the king, Shebna, the scribe, who would write the commandments of the laws, write the commandments of the Lord, and Joah, the son of Asaph, the recorder, came out to them. Now, by comparison to the Tartan, to the Rapsaurus, to the Rebshika, now we have Iliakim, we have uh, Shebna, and we have Joah. By comparison, in your mind, who carries the most clout? One has is considered the chief of staff, commander in chief, governor, chief officer. And here we have somebody overseeing the household of the king, a scribe, and a recorder. By visual, you would say. It looks like the king of Assyria is sending men that are more prominent than these men here. And if you're looking at appearance only, it doesn't look promising. And this is how the Lord God works, right? And the writer was very intentional of pointing this out. Because on paper, it doesn't look very good. But notice he is now calling to Hezekiah and these three men respond. Now, I'm not sure why they're there at the aqueduct, but this is where this conversation is taking place. This speech here, beginning with verse 18, and when they had called to the king Eliakim, the son of Hilakiah, who was over the household, Shebna, the scribe, and Joah, the son of Asaph, the recorder, came out to them, and the, Rebsh the Rebshakeh said to them, say now to Hezekiah, thus says the great king of Assyria, what confidence is in which you trust? You having plans and power for war, but are they mere words? In whom do you trust that you rebel against me? So we see this tour de France type of speech that Rebshakeh is now giving the three representations, representatives of King Hezekiah. One of the effective Mo, mo, one of the effective uh, things that the Assyrians were very effective in, well, let me say this again. One of the things that the Assyrians were very effective in was espionage. Because look what he says here. He says in verse 21, and I'm going to just, uh, oh, in verse 20, you rebel against me? In verse 21, he references Egypt. Remember when... Uh, Hosea, king of Samaria, wanted to make a deal with, with, uh, with the king of Egypt. He tried to double cross the king of Assyria. And he's saying that you, you tore down the high places. See, how did the Syrians know this? Because they would have spies throughout the region. 
And this is what the Assyrians were known for. How is it that Satan knows your ways? He can't read our minds, but he watches. And he has representatives throughout the world that are watching you. And they study you. And they know you. They know your faults. They, they are, he is, Satan is, and not to bring glory and honor to him, because there's no glory and honor in this. He's a, he has minions that spy on you. How does he know what's going on in your life? Because somebody's reporting it back to him. And the Assyrians do the same thing. They were highly effective at espionage. Their spy network seemed to know everything that was going on in Judah. And the Rabshaka made this, used this inside information to intimidate Judah, to intimidate his enemies. He's saying that your resistance, that you want to resist the king of Assyria, the great king of Assyria, is futile. It will never work out. You, you're too weak. He said, you're going to turn to Egypt? In verse 21, you're, you're, you're going to trust in this broken reed, Egypt, that... Even if you put your hand against it, that if you lean to it, his hand and pierce it. So the Pharaoh king of Egypt is to all who trust in him. He's talking smack about Egypt, about the king, about Pharaoh. Pharaoh was flawed. He was a flawed ally, too flimsy to lean on. So Judah, Jerusalem, you would not be successful in battle if you go to him. The army that is surrounded here was simply too powerful. The Repshika even says here, and I'm going to go back to all of this, you guys. In verse 24, he says, I'm sorry, in verse um, 23, I urge you, I pledge to trust my master, trust the king of Assyria. Here's some smack talking. Look what he says here. I will give you 2,000 horses if you're able to do your part and put riders on them. You're too small. I'll give you 2,000 horses, but you know what? You don't even have enough people to ride them. So why even do that? These proud military boasts were accompanied by clever spiritual attacks. But I want us to take a look at some of the questions that Rabshaka is now presenting and how these questions are directed to the leaders and how that applies to our lives. Look at verse 18, you guys. It says... Uh, uh, I'm sorry, notice how these, in verse 18, notice how the leaders of the King Hezekiah are questioned. In verses 19 to 25, we see crafty arguments from the enemy. These are arguments and questions that are casting fear and doubt into the minds of the, the Israelites or the ones from Jerusalem. When you look at verses 19 and 20, and it says here 19, then the Rebshka said to them, Say now to Hezekiah, thus says the great king, the king of Assyria, what confidence is in this which you boast? You speak of having plans and powerful war, but they're mere words. And in whom do you trust? That you rebel against me? So we see here the questioning of confidence. Confidence is being questioned here. Your confidence to be delivered, your co confidence to be rescued, your confidence in hope is now being questioned. Don't we say that today, men? Our confidence is in the Lord. Our strength is in the Lord. We sing songs about that. And the first place the enemy will want to attack is your confidence in God. Your confidence in that God will deliver you. Your confidence that, in your confidence that God will sustain you and, and rescue you, he wants to attack that confidence, that God will deliver you. He says here that you trust in the plans that you have, in the power in the Lord that you have. You really trust that against the great king, the king of Assyria? What, what confidence do you really have if you're trusted in Hezekiah? What confidence do you really have if you're trusting in the Lord? And verse 20 says, you speak of having plans for war? You can't even horse, put 2,000 men on horses. 
They're only mere words. And do you trust that you can rebel against me? You really think you have the confidence and the power and the faith to come up against the great king of Assyria? Have you ever been hit with questions like that, men? Do you really think you can do that? You really think you can come on a Tuesday morning at 6.30 in the morning and have a Bible study? Do you really think you can overcome the lust of pornography? Do you really think you can get through this? Do you really think that God can deliver you? You really think you can stand up against me? And all your words are just mere words? Your words to the Lord, your prayers, you, you really think that's going to work? Those are the battles that we have, men. The confidence in the God delivering us. Our confidence in for deliverance is always questioned by the enemy. Your words are empty. They don't mean anything. I have counseled and, and I, have, I am the strength for war. So why do you rely on yourself? You really think you can do this? Verse 21 is questioning the strength of our friends, our allies to deliver us. Verse 21, now look, you are trusting this, the staff of this broken reed, Egypt, on which if a man leans, it will go into his hand and pierce it. So fear the king of Egypt to all who trust in him. Verse 22 tells us the question of our ability, the ability for our God to deliver you. Now, let me ask you guys a question. By a raise of hands here. Has God ever delivered you from anything? If so, raise your hand. All of us. All of us have been delivered. Everyone, everyone single one of us in here has been delivered from something. And if, and if somebody was saying to you, a high official was saying to you, you think that God has really delivered you? Do you really think so? Do you think your God is really able to deliver you jacked up? You're jacked up. Your mind's a mess. Your heart's a mess. You think God is really going to deliver you? Verse 22 is that same echoing message. Look what it says here. But you say to me, we trust in the Lord our God. It is not he whose high places and whose altar Hezekiah has taken away and said to Judah and Jerusalem, you shall worship before this altar in Jerusalem. What the enemy is doing here is twisting words. Did God really tell you? Did God really deliver you? Words are being twisted here. Because remember in chapter 18, verses 1 through 8, we looked at all the great things Hezekiah has done. And one of the first things that he done was, that he did was that he removed all the high places. And now this person is saying, you're worshiping the Lord? Didn't you remove all the high places? Yes, Hezekiah did because it was for idol worshiping. But guess what? People are listening. People are listening to this conversation that is going on here. Right now, it's just uh, not even a conversation. It's this Rabshika is speaking to these three people, uh, the Elikiah, to uh, Shebna, and to Joah. And he's speaking to them and saying, wasn't it, you, didn't you just remove all the high places where you're supposed to be worshiping the Lord? And now you're only told to go to Jerusalem to worship? He's twisting the words because he is not revealing that those places that were removed were high places for idol worshiping. The enemy will twist our words, men. You trust in the Lord, you trust in the Lord your God, but didn't you just remove all those high places for worship? Twisting words. The enemy plays like the great Leviathan who would use our words, use God's words, that they're twisted in our mind. The Leviathan would attack and twist and pull his opponents down and come back up and twist and pull their opponents down and, and they're confused and they're disoriented. We hear the Leviathan in the Old Testament. And the enemy does the same thing. He twists 
words that God has said to us when he has delivered us from sin, when he's delivered us from pornography, when he's delivered us from lust, he's delivered us from drug addiction. And a lot of times the enemy says, did he really deliver you from this? You really trust in God? You really trust in him? Look, didn't you just remove all the high places and, and aren't you supposed to trust in him and believe in him? One of the commentaries point out that the Reb Shekhar mistakenly thought that Hezekiah's improvement in removing these idols from all over the land and replenishing sexual worship in Jerusalem that talks about in 2 in Kings chapter 18, verse 4, that he removed the opportunities to worship God. Six arguments that the Reb Shekhar used to persuade Hezekiah to surrender. We saw in verses 19 and 21 that Egypt was undependable. Verse 22, we just looked at, the altars of the Lord throughout the land have been removed. Here in verses 23 and 24, he says, Now therefore I urge you, give a pledge to my master, the king of Assyria. Make a promise, and I will give to you 2,000 horses if you're able to ride, be able to, your part, put riders on them. How then will you repel one captain of the least of my master's servants and put your trust in Egypt for chariots and horsemen? He's saying here that we're overwhelmingly powerful. How can you stand and have confidence in your God? Because look, we have a great army surrounding us. We're here with Tao. And you can't even put riders on 2,000 horsemen from, from, from Egypt. Don't you see we're more powerful than you? Another argument that Seneca, that this Reb Shekha is telling that we can hear the enemy telling us in verse 25. Have I now come up without the Lord against this place to destroy it? The Lord said to me, go up in this land and destroy it. What a lie. But yet we believe it. We will believe lies like this. He is saying that God, Jehovah God, has told Sennacherib, king of Assyria, and that God is with him to come up and destroy Jerusalem, the chosen people. And this lie that is being told, this, talk, this talking smack is now putting doubt in the people's mind is that, did God really send them up? Look at this great army around me. Look at these three important people sent from the king of Assyria. No doubt that they were dressed in such a way that they stood out from anybody else. The commander in chief, the chief of staff and the governor of the king of Assyria are there now with a great army surrounding Fuller's field to about to attack Jerusalem. How would that look? And now this guy is saying, look, God sent me. It's obvious. Where are your people? You don't even have 2,000 people to get choice uh, horses from, it, from, from Egypt. You want to lean on Egypt for power who's powerful? <laughs> we'll blow right through them like a reed. Look at us. See, God sent me. God has sent me to destroy you. You're really God's people? The enemy lies to us exactly the same way. We may be facing a daunting situation. And the enemy is saying... God sent me. God wants you to go through this. God doesn't love you. He can't forgive of your sin. That sin you committed last night, remember that sin you committed last night? God can never forgive you for it. Remember how you did this or you did that, cheated on this and cheated on that? God can never forgive you. And this is what he's telling the people. And they are scared. Going on in verses 31 and 32, we're not going to go that far, but I want to talk about these, these arguments, the, this speech. When you look at verses 31 and 32, we'll be looking at this next week. It says, Do not listen to Hezekiah, for thus says the king of Assyria, Make peace with me by a present, and come out to me, and every one of you will eat from his own vine, and every one of you from fig tree, and every one of you drink the waters of his own cistern. 
until I come and take you away to a land like your own, a land of grain and new wine, a land of bread and vineyards, a land of olive groves and honey, that you may live and not die. For do not listen to Hezekiah, for fear that he persuade you in saying, the Lord will deliver us. See so how pretty the picture the enemy is painting here for them? Surrender to me. You know, when I was out in the world doing my thing, for some reason, it always seemed attractive to pick up some drugs, go to a hotel, and think that all these women were going to be there. And I would think that in my mind. And this enemy is painting this picture of you're going to, it's going to be a party with your friends. You're going to have girls there. You're going to have alcohol there. You're going to have drugs there. You're going to be at a hotel. And it was just like this, this picture the enemy is painting to me that it's going to be all fun and games when I go and I'm alone. I'm paranoid. And I'm by myself. There was no picture. There was no picture painting of me being severed from family because of my choices. No picture of me being strung out. No picture of me being cut off from all my friends and family. No picture of me being broke. No picture of me coming down. And here the enemy is painting this picture. Don't listen to Hezekiah. You want some milk and honey? Come to Assyria. That's where it's at. I'm going to give you your own trees to eat your dates, your own figs, drink from your own cistern. I'm going to set it up for you good. So don't listen to that guy. Come to me. The enemy does the same thing, men. He paints this picture that, it, that it's going to be the vida loca if we go out there. Paints this picture that it's going to be pretty, women, this, that. I can tell you all the years I've been using drugs, it was never like that. It was always paranoia, loneliness, destitute, destruction. And I bought into it. Yes, it's going to be that way. And I was enslaved by the enemy. No other gods will be able to save the nations. Only the Assyrians can. In verses 33, it says, Have any of the gods of the nations that have delivered it from the land, have ever delivered it from the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and Aphrad? Where are the gods of Seravim and Hena and Iva? Indeed, they have delivered Samaria from my hand. Who among all the gods of the lands have delivered their countries from my hand that the Lord should deliver Jerusalem from my hand? Now he's putting fear. Going to back to verse 23, he now says, make a pledge to me. Give me a peace offering. Make a treaty with me. Come bargain with my master, the king of Assyria, and I will give you everything you want. Verse 24 questions our ability to survive even the slightest, slightest attack. How then will you repel against one of the captains of the least of my ma master's servants? Put your trust in Egypt? So he's saying whatever we put our ability to serve, that even the slightest attack, we will crumble. Don't serve God. Don't go to church. Don't go to Bible study. How can you then repel one of the least of my master's, captains of my master's, army and you can think you come up against us it's sad when the Assyrians have to teach us that how flimsy and foolish and fragile is the object that we trust in outside of God men what are the things that you trust in or maybe God has been outside of it all along is your trust and hope in God it's sad when the Assyrians can divine that your trust in Egypt is more than your trust in the Lord. It's sad when the Assyrians can expose our foolishness rather than our faith. And in verse 25, it tells us that questioning which side your God is really on. I have now come up without the Lord against this place to destroy it. The Lord sent me. The Rapshako was like an unwanted party guest who stays too long and talks too loudly. And in verse 26, Hezekiah's men quickly found themselves wishing that he would just be quiet. See, one of the things that the Rapshako is doing here that we haven't gotten to yet, and we're going to close with this right here, guys. 
is that there's people around that are listening. There's people around that are watching. No doubt that now with this great army surrounded that there's people that have come out because they're at the Fuller's Field and there's a gate there that people would hang out at. And no doubt that there's people there that are listening because in verse 26, Elika says to Rabshakeh, speak to us in Aramaic. We don't want these people that are listening to hear. It says, please speak to your servants in Aramaic for we understand it and do not speak to us in Hebrew in the hearing of all the people who are on the wall. So he's asking them, don't speak in Hebrew, speak in Aramaic. This provides evidence of a serious skill at international relations because Sennacherib's representatives were also fluent in Aramaic and in Hebrew and in Arabic or where they were speaking in Persia at that time. This meant the people on the wall of Jerusalem were listening to, were listening and could understand everything that Rabshakeh was saying. And the last thing that Hezekiah's officials wanted was for Assyrians' intimidating words to spread across the city. So they asked Sennacherib, represented to follow the protocol and speak to them in Aramaic, the language of diplomacy. So we see here that the Rabshaka is now talking so that everybody hears. The Rabshaka was disdainfully told the people of Judah that God would not help them to deliver them from danger. And we know this isn't true, but also men, sometimes we have our own doubts. When we're facing some sort of problem and all our solutions have been failed, sometimes that inner Rabshaka in our hearts causes us to think that God is going to fail us. But a good promise to cling to in those moments is that we find in the beginning of Psalm 46, God is our refuge and God is our strength, a very present help in trouble. Another sturdy promise comes from Psalm 27, verse 3. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Through war arise against me, I will be confident. Do we have that inner rapture taking place in our hearts? Because if we do, men, listen to the voice of the Lord. Next week, we're going to pick up where we left off here. Some more things I want to go over. But we see this smack talking taking place. And the enemy works the same way, men, into our hearts and our minds. We begin to listen to the chatter of the enemy. But we're to hang on to God's promises. Fortify our hearts, men, with God's word, with prayer and in fellowship. Spend time in God's word. Because we will have those inner repshikas that are going to come and cast doubt. The enemy is going to be whispering, all right, did God really say, are you really? No, you can't be. We want to be men. Today, the enemy is trying to take you out. All of us have a high priority target on our backs. And the first place that battle is going to begin is here. Put on the helmet of salvation. It's going to be here. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. Put on the full armor of God that we may stand in these times. Because men, our times are getting short. And this world needs godly men like you. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. Lord, we thank you so much for allowing us to be here this morning, Lord. And we're just so thankful, Lord, that we can study your word and see, Lord, this is how it applies to our lives. And Lord, we just thank you, Lord, in these last days that you have called us to be men of God, to stand for your truth. So, man, uh, Lord, may we put on the armor of God. May we be men of God in these last days fighting for our families, for our wives, for our communities, for our children, our grandchildren. And may we always bring you glory in everything we do. Lord, we lift up our pastor this morning as he's preparing for our, our, our study tomorrow evening and Lord, we'll celebrate communion. Lord, may we all gather together for that time as well. We love you and we praise you. Bless the fellowship afterwards in Jesus' name. Amen. So we can continue the fellowship out there. No breakfast, you guys. Our kitchen is out of order. Somebody wants to bring breakfast next week. Talk to Raymond. Uh, you'll reap many rewards in heaven. <laughs> so I'm <laughs> just teasing. Um, but we can go out there and fellowship. God bless you guys and, and thank you. Also, I don't know if Andy's going to be here. I think he may be in the patio. If not, reminder, uh, men's 
barbecue tickets are on sale, you can get them online, or Raymond will be selling them out of his trunk for 15 bucks afterwards. Uh, get them now for six, though. So Andy might be out there. We can see him out there. God bless you guys. Thank you guys for online.